I just want to say hi to some of my Loma Linda friends. <clears throat> there is Dr. Bernard Taylor, is my friend. And there is, uh, I think, Wolfgang. I have seen him. I saw him a while ago. And there is my sister in Trondheim. You know, how is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are fortunate. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, I can say hello from Trondheim, Norway. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Sigve, a former um... Well, maybe still, I'm not sure, you know, what official, his official membership is, but somebody with a young person with connections here at Green Lake Church is uh, teaching at Middle East College this year. So when I heard that he was going there, I was kind of excited going, wow, that, that, that yeah. takes me way back. Wow. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Before we get um, started, or maybe we are started, and I'll just ask a question that in a sense is, um, um, well, you can either dismiss it because it would take away or you go, yeah, John, that's a good question, either way. Um, but I, one of the things I've been interested in is the, um, the question of authorship of the book of John. And I know that standard scholarship, it's a very, very, very late there are some who have argued that it has to be very early because there's no mention of the fall of Jerusalem in the book. And yet the book is set with most, mostly in Judea, in Jerusalem, but there's no hint that Jerusalem has, has been captured by the Romans. And I have sometimes thought as I read through the book that in addition to that piece, and it seems to me that the book reads can I say it? The tone of the book sounds to me more like something that would be written by somebody young in age and, and still new in their excitement about Jesus, rather than somebody who is very, very old in age, you know, and had been, you know, anyway, that they, there's certain elements of the spirituality which seem to strike me as having that more intensity that I would associate with young in age and young in experience rather than somebody very old. And I was just wondering if you would care to address that at all. <clears throat> well, it's, it's a big, you know, it's a big subject in that because uh, the Gospel of John does, you know, does uh, lets uh, the author into the story more, more than, than other Gospels. There is a presence there, and in the end, it says that there, there is the claim of eyewitness testimony that he who testifies these things, you know, that that it's true, you know, and and it kind of certifies itself at the end as a as the as the first hand account. So it seems to me that is something one has to to respect. I think there is that is a very big. Uh, big uh, point in, in, in the last chapter of, of the Gospel of John who did this, you know, and to what extent is the eyewitness that claims to participate in the ending of the story, to what extent is that eyewitness also there the whole time through? Of course, if you say that the beloved disciple is John, the son of Zebedee, then, then you have fixed it and everything is fine you know, which is the traditional view and which was the, the view of some of the earliest extra biblical uh, sources that we have, but it is not, it's not the only one. So the eyewitness element in the story, some people say, oh, it was Lazarus. 
you know, Jesus, he's the disciple that Jesus loved, or it was Nicodemus, or it was Mary, you know, there are other candidates, and, and there are big books written about these candidates, and it's very, it's a lot of fun to, to, to you know, see the reasons, you know, Nathaniel, you know, maybe it was him, or it was some, some other, you know, some other person. There is another John candidate that my uh, one of my former teachers, Richard Bauckham, thinks that that the author here is not John the Apostle, but it is John the Elder. I think you mentioned another thing about, you know, is it a young person? Is it an older person? And that that is a merit. There is merit to that, but but. It seems to me, so you have the element or the claim of eyewitness testimony, but it is not eyewitness testimony written down the next day, you know. It is a matured memory. It has, it, somebody's had an incubation period. So that is the other element in the Gospel of John, the notion of community and Johannine community and issues like that. So. I think there is an emphasis on community in the Gospel of John that this is a memory. And when the beloved disciple dies, that is something that affects the community deeply at the end. There is, some, there is awareness of that. He, the rumor spread that he would not die till Jesus comes. But then he, there is awareness that he will die. And he did, in fact, die, you know. And one of the most amazing things written on the Gospel of John, the long epic poem written by Robert Browning, the British, one of the great British poets, called The Death in the Desert, where he meditates on the death of the beloved disciple. How will it be when there is no longer any more eyewitness? You know, how will that how will that uh, time be, and so on. So, so it seems to me that, that you can retain the notion of eyewitness testimony and the sort of, you know, the, the, the details, you know, it was about noon, you know, there was this amount and there were five porticos and there were, you know, all kinds of details. certify it as eyewitness, but it is a remembered, remember, a memory at a distance. So it could be, it could be that, you know, that it is, it's, uh, there is a book written 50 years ago by J. Lewis Martin, History and Theology in the Fourth Gospel, that claims that, that this gospel is mostly a testimony to the Johannine community and the life of that community and less so a first-hand testimony about the life of Jesus. That you had a spectacular career. It just impacted Johannine studies for two, two, three, four decades. And now with a lot of New Testament archaeology taking place, that is relevant for the Gospel of John. I see Johannine scholars, in, in when we have these international meetings, they are just squirming because they have to abandon that view by J. Lewis Martin that was so entrenched that it was mostly about the community. And the Sabbath miracles, that shows you know something that has to do with Johannine community. So it, there are many, many things in play, but but I, you know, there has, there, there is definitely a sort of gravitating back to the possibility that you have in the core of the Gospel of John, eyewitness testimony, high quality, first hand eyewitness testimony. <laughs> so let's go back to your, um, since I hijacked this there for a minute, let, let's go back to the content of your sermon and then any other questions. Well, basically, I'll say, let me hand it over to you and, and those who are here participating with us uh, to go ahead with the conversation. Um, I was, I want, to thank you. I want to thank you for the presentations you gave this morning. I loved the close analysis of scripture. 
I love the pairing with famous paintings and works of literature, since I'm a <laughs> literature scholar. And I really especially liked the questions you raised. I mean, it was tantalizing, it was fun, and it was serious. I Thank you. I thank wanted you. to come to the question about whether Jesus had to take the route through Samaria. And um, I've just took a trip down to Southern California. I'm in our winter home in Palm Desert. We drove from Seattle a week ago. And um, we have a choice of what route to take every time we make this journey. We could go boring Interstate 5, which is like the red line you showed on your map. But instead, we usually try to try choose a blue line road, which is a little less direct. And <clears throat> especially with the coronavirus pandemic, we think might be less infected. So we've been doing that. And last the last time we drove, we drove via Death Valley. And our thinking when we do this is, what kind of surprises might we encounter along the way? So my, my question for you is, do you think Jesus was looking for a surprise to be ambushed himself by choosing to go through Samaria? Well, I think that that is a good option too. <laughs> I, I think, you know, that this is what, what is nice about text. I have taught, since I have trained as a medical doctor, I have said that reading of texts is similar to the work of a doctor, that when a patient comes in with a certain set of symptoms, you know from the start that it can have more than one explanation. You know, there can be more than one explanation for a given set of findings. And then you say, is it this, is it this, is it this? That's what you do in medicine. But you also do it with texts. You know, it could, it, the text is there you know, is it only one, is there only one option? No, there is more than one option. You just gave us several, you know, now, and you even say, you know, that Jesus is a curious person. He wonders, you know, I should go to Samaria. I wonder what will happen, you know, and he does all this ad hoc, you know, the big, the big th thing there, though, is that he says, you have had five husbands. Is he just taking a wild guess, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he seems to know what is going on and someone must have informed him of that, you know, and that is the issue, you know, where I, I, I put that in, you know, powers of observation versus sources of information. I think there is a lot to be said for a Jesus who has extraordinary powers of observation, who really sees and absorbs, you know, you notice the indifference of his disciples, you know, how detached they are and how engaged he is. You know, it's amazing, the contrast between him and them in that story. But, but I, I, I'm, I will add your option to my, to my repertoire, <laughs> that he went there so he could be ambushed. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was you. really struck. Yeah, I was really struck by the fact that Jesus is coming from the point of um, one who needs something. So he is mm. there in a supplicant position, right? And sometimes when when we come and we talk to people and we witness uh, and in talk about Christianity we come from a superior point like we are the ones who are giving something but Jesus starts as the one who is in need yeah that is an excellent point and and in in what I called confidence building measures you know I don't think you can that is so so amazing and so wonderful that you bring that out and I did not uh, bring it out as much as it should have been done so I'm happy that you are doing it now you know yes he puts himself as though he is a person in need he puts it he in some ways puts her himself below her you know that she can help him and and you know that is amazing very very good Sigbe <clears throat> To what extent do you see uh, what you said this morning as a, an exposition on Don, John 2, 23 to 25, where ahead of the story of Nicodemus, Jesus alerts us to the fact that he doesn't need anyone to tell him 
he had needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. Yeah, I need to tell the others in the group here that that you have taught the Gospel of John at, at Loma Linda, and you are an expert on the Gospel of John and an expert in biblical languages and 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 uh, but i think your point is a good good point there is you know exactly how to make that specific you know to say he knew everything he knew what was in man you know is this is this then the superior sources of information or could that too you know be a superior powers of observation you know in uh, so how how do you get this knowledge 120 some years ago, someone wrote a book in Germany about the life of Jesus in the Gospel of John, a, a person by the name of William Breda. And he said that in the Gospel of John, Jesus strides majestically across the earth like a stranger, like he is someone who doesn't touch the ground, you know, that he is a sort of a, you know, almost like an extraterrestrial you know, uh, person, because he is so superior, you know, now that view has not, uh, you know, held up. So, but I, uh, you know, the, the, uh, that there is some relation to the text you mentioned in chapter two and the story in chapter four, I think that's a very, a very plausible, plausible relation and, and something to think about for sure, you yeah. know. Jesus permits, Jesus permits himself to be in a situation where I sense a sense of superiority on her hand when she says, in effect, you've got the first, the thirst, I've got the water. If your water is so effective, why are you thirsty? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Very good. <laughs> I, you know, I would like to chime in on the, the knowledge of the five husbands. So, you know, as I've gotten old, I, you know, I'm, well, and I, I think of, you know, when I think of German critical scholarship and, and the whole mindset of that, which in many ways is the modern Western scientific materialistic perspective. And, it, and that perspective and approach has, has been fruitful for a lot of things. I mean, so, you know, a lot, a lot of science, a lot of the naturalistic or materialistic perspective, you know, brought into science, it's accomplished a lot. So I'm not, I'm not wanting to, to trash that or throw stones in the way that is often done within an Adventist or, or, or you know, Christian context. So I, I honor the power of that. But my, my only, my pushback on that would be that it because it has been powerful and effective, we assume that it is then, you know, sort of omni, and I don't know, you know what word you want, omnipotent or whatever, that, it, that it, it is capable now of explaining everything and it isn't. And I guess I'm reminded when I read in some non-Christian material, you know, completely different context, where in worlds where there are, you know, spiritual powers that to me is a, a Westerner, I just read it and I go, that's really weird. There's nothing in my experience that connects to that. But the, the capability of a particular person, in this case, Jesus, having knowledge about this person in front of him that did not come to him through any ordinary means. I mean, it's, I, the reading that I do you know, in other cultures and other settings says that my experience was says, you can't do that. You know, the only way Jesus can know is somebody had to told, tell him, or he had, looking at that woman, he's able to observe something about her. I'm going, my reading in other cultures says, maybe I'm, I'm too small. In other cultures, it would not be surprising that a person like Jesus, not always, but at least on occasion, would have specific personal information about a person that came to him through spiritual means that are not amenable to any scientific or rational um, explanation. 
Well, yeah, just I'm just thinking about you know her in that in uh, also you know while, while you were talking because so you know she is quite capable you know she is uh, and and she must have been let's say that the usual story is is true that she had had you know that she has she has had uh, many relationships and there is still she is still someone. Uh, who is desirable in, 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 in some ways. You could say that she is, so she, you know, it's quite, you know, if you think about these relationships as, as just ordinary adultery, there would be some kind of penalty for that, but somehow she has escaped that, If again, as accepting the story. And then she engages him with a theological subject quite competently. And after, afterwards, she goes to the city and she has an enormous impact. You know, her testimony really, really resonates. So, so this is, a, in some ways, you could say she's a can-do person. Now, my wild theory that Jesus had been there before and that he picked up village gossip, it was, you know, everybody knows that she is at five husbands. That's the first thing anyone mentions about her. <laughs> it's not totally, it's, it's knowable. Let's just say you can know things about a person that way if you are listening and if you pay attention, you know. But, you know, so let's say that, yes, this was supernatural. He knew it all because the Holy Spirit whispered things. If, if that is how you know things, then Jesus is not you are risking a little bit of a, a uh, you know, sort of Christology where Jesus' humanity is at risk because he can do stuff that nobody else can do. You know, it's, it's, hard, it's a hard act to follow, <laughs> you know, because you can't, you know, anyway, but these options should be there, and I think my option should also be there that he that he knew it some other way than than just supernatural way. But for sure, that that is also possible. Uh, I'd like to ask, how did Jesus know what Simon was thinking when uh, when he? Uh, when, of course, it might have been obvious from the expression on Simon's face, looking at the woman disapprovingly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is a good, that's another excellent, excellent, <laughs> excellent question. <laughs> you know, that, but th this is, you know, the, there is a, a sort of omniscient factor in the Gospel of John that Jesus knows everything and, and the person who writes the Gospel knows everything. And there is a homogeneity in the gospel too, because everyone talks the same way. When Jesus talks, John the Baptist talks, and the beloved disciple who uh, eyewitness testimony, when they talk, they talk the same way. There is a kind of the homogenization of time, it seems to me, has, has worked its way on this gospel. But, but I like to think that, that the primary voice is the voice of Jesus and 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 that that it has in that there has been some some accretion some other things have been deposited on that memory and it's all good it's all all done done by the spirit and by by uh, the the you know the the comforter so but you know there are many many things there <laughs> I keep thinking about the, the time when uh, Jesus was uh, uh, brought to, they brought to his attention rather forcefully, the, the woman that they claimed to be caught in adultery. Uh, and I've noticed that in some of the versions I have that that story is said to be uh, written by someone other than John. Do you yeah. have a so that no that that the manuscript evidence on that story is is you know has made that uh, uh, you know a little bit 
impossible because it isn't it 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 appears in other places too uh, in uh, you know, and not in that place in the gospel of john so so but you know that's kind of where it has ended up and 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 it it's uh, it seems to fit there <laughs> but but you know that's kind of habit you know on my part you know the reader habits i have too so so but the, the manuscript evidence is that there is a that is a kind of loose fragment that mm -hmm. still should probably be considered part of the canon but exactly where it belongs is an issue do you, do you think that that maybe the miracles that Jesus performed are are at, I mean there's certainly some form of evidence of his divinity but uh, yeah I don't know I was struck by the fact that that Jesus treated Simon with such respect after noticing what Simon was thinking and and Simon walked out of there uh, a, a feeling as if he was uh, well treated, and, and I think that may be more evidence of his divinity, maybe than the miracles. Yeah, in in the Gospel of John, the miracles are called signs, and the sign is a kind of is a means more than miracle. It means means something that you know makes something manifest that is. It's a sign of revelation, and and it has a it's it's, it's these are, you know Jesus isn't just a miracle worker; he is a revealer, mm -hmm. and it is the revealing thing. Everything is sort of uh, under the discipline of the revelation that he brings to bear. No one has ever seen God, but the only one who is, you know. The only one of God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. So, so the signs are very sparing in the Gospel of John. You know, there are six or seven, you know, miracle stories, and that's and they are all very, very drawn out. You know, it's not just fast paced. You know, there is a sign, and then there is a reaction to the sign, and and big conflict usually. So. It's uh, quite unique the way the gospel does does deals with those those elements. Sigve, well, uh, Sigve, the um, your points about the woman and the role that, that she has taken in relationship to the present day um, are very apropos and, and we so easily miss them in the past. And when you think about what the deciding factor was, her two responses, I think, are truly remarkable. First of all, she raised her question, and for far too long, I thought she was throwing up a barrier, and you well laid the foundation for her question, which was her life question. Here is this woman in these circumstances, but she longed to know where the truth lay. Samaria, Mount Gerizim, or Jerusalem, and Jesus says, Jerusalem, and the time is coming. And um, at the end, oh, and then, then, of course, she goes back and tells everybody that she saw. What made her believe? This revelation, that's all that it took. It wasn't theology or a whole lot of things. And she was compelled by what she had heard and the implications of it. And she came back on fire, I expect, and they had to go and see what was going on. And you mentioned the evangelism that she conducted, and this is heretical Judaism. And at the end, their conclusion is that Jesus is the Messiah of the cosmos, which is the word that John uniformly uses. 
Yeah, that that's great, you know. But the the Gospel of John, of course, it has all these encounters Jesus with all these individuals, and especially with women. You know, the role of women in the Gospels. There is no Gospel that has a lot such prominence to women as the Gospel of John, and and her story is is very very distinctive in that regard. But but there are all, all these encounters with individuals. So, so mission in the Gospel of John is in some ways incarnational. It's local. You know, it's not on television. It's, it's all, you know, he goes there, he meets that person. He goes there, it's evening, it's late, he meets Nicodemus. You know, he comes to Pilate. They have long conversations in the Gospel of John. You know, it's amazing. I mean, who can't love this Gospel? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> is it okay to go back to um the question a question maybe from this morning from sava school yeah um first of all i have to thank you so much and reiterate what carla already said thank you so very much for bringing up the questions that you did and stimulating the thoughts that we have um but I feel totally out of my league with all you scholars and, and great thinkers, but what came to me about this morning's presentation was you, you were trying to tie in the beginning to the end and this and that. And I have never ever thought of the story of the wedding as anything other than Jesus first miracle. No big deal. Yeah, it happened. And we as Adventists, of course, don't drink. So why would he be doing this and all that sort of thing? But by the time you were done with all your presentation and questions and thoughts that came to mind, this is my story and I'm sticking to it. I don't know if anybody else will agree, but to me, this was the most amazing story that he could have presented because he always presents himself as a bridegroom and here he is at a wedding. And to me, this is the, the perfect um, first story to show us what heaven is going to be like this huge celebration everybody there eating and drinking and being merry and being so happy to be in god's presence and the wine in the story representing the things that we think are as are important and joyous and and happy things on earth when they don't even begin to compare with what we're going to have in heaven the special wine that jesus created and I don't know why that came to me, but I had never, ever thought those lines before. And I thank you so much for bringing me that story that I can remember. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's, uh, that's a wonderful thought. So, yeah, I, all I will say in the you know, comment there is that, that I would like to develop this, that from that point in the story of the wedding to to the ending of the story, my hour has not yet come. And then he will say in chapter 12, my hour has come, the hour has come. And to decipher the meaning of the hour and then also the tenor of the hour because the, the wedding is a very joyful occasion. So what's the tenor of the hour when it when it does come? So I, I'd love to, to converse with with you guys about that. Well, Sigmund, what time is it in Oslo right now? Now it is a quarter past 10 at night. Okay, Europe, well. I, I, I think you are onto something, yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. So um, let, let's just emphasize again, everybody, uh, Sigbe will be back with us at 9.30 tomorrow morning using this same link uh, for his third presentation. Now, is that going to focus on the hour in John 12? Let's see. Now, yeah, it's going okay. to focus on the hour, but, but I have dawn. I have dusk and dawn. So, I, yes, the main thing is about, you know, how Jesus defines this hour. But there are also things that are sort of, extraneous matters where everyone in the end comes together and they all perform from the script of abundance it's amazing 
and John just gets everyone on board to do abundance. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's 9.30 tomorrow morning, and we will let you get some sleep. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you can join us again tomorrow. Um, these uh, sessions are all going to be archived on the Green Lake YouTube channel. So if uh, you want to see it again or if you want to share it with your friend, you can direct them to the uh, Green Lake YouTube channel and these presentations will be there. So hope to see all of you tomorrow. Sigve, thank you. Uh, let's pray as we close. Lord in heaven, thank you for the words of the gospel. Thank you for the ministry of Jesus and the spirit. We pray that you will minister to us and through us in the week to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to make uh, just two comments before we go, if possible. Number one, um, back to the wedding feast. When Jesus turned the wine, uh, uh, I mean, went into the wine, I heard the opinion that it wasn't a, a wine that people expected, like, um, you know, alcoholic content, but it was a pure juice. That's why they enjoyed it even more, saying that it's even better than the first one. That's the first comment. And the second comment is when a mother approaches Jesus and tell him about the lack of wine at the feast, for some reason, I have a thought that she probably knew about Jesus' capacity or uh, extraordinary, uh, you know, um, uh, gift that he had to intervene and actually make wine. Uh, have any of you thought about it? Why did she ask him at that time? I think she knew that he could do it. He could do a miracle. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we we'll to take the last comment first, that she has expectations of him. You know, this is something you need to do something about, you know, and, and, uh, and she thinks that she has gotten a green light from him because she tells the servant, do everything he tells you, you know, so, so, so that she has an awareness of him and his extraordinary things that, that seems to be, I think that's valid. And then on the, on the other thing about the, kind of wine of course that is one you know problem in in our church because we have we're not like this story that's you know it's kind of a stumbling block you know who knows what it was what he gave them but if non-alcoholic wine wine is superior if you can make a sort of quality argument there then he was this was the highest quality you know and and the 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 sort of customs of drinking customs, I think, in, in that culture that, that to get inebriated was probably not, not, uh, not a very, very good thing. So, so I think there is some, you know, you can, you can make that part of the story non-threatening to us, those of us who feel, feel that, uh, that, that we don't want to give much prestige to alcoholic beverages. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. I'd say good night from here. <laughs>